Amen. 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 Okay. Well, I just could go on about that all day. So let me let me just say a few words about what the Feast of Tabernacles is. We've had Rosh Hashanah, the new year. Ten days later, we had the Day of Atonement, which was last, by the way, right on the hour before Day of Atonement was was um, was coming. That's when in that out, right after the sun went down, about 8, 830 that Wednesday night, that's when we she found out her offer was accepted. Yes. After a lot of negotiating. It's funny. And then so the other thing I observed is this 10 days that everything has to be done and confirmed before the sale can move forward is happening before the Feast of Tabernacles closes. Wow. It's like within the last few days. So I believe that God's presence is all over this house Amen. and all over you. Yes. But we need to invite God in. Yes. So let me just give you a little bit of background on what Feast of Tabernacles is. So it's the, the third of the appointed times. Um, God's instruction for celebrating the feast is in Leviticus 23, 34 through uh, 43, where he tells his people to go to the countryside, cut down palm fronds, cut down leafy branches, and build a temporary shelter to resemble the tabernacles that he used to dwell with them when they were in the desert in Egypt, when he when he delivered them out of Egypt, as they were getting ready to go to the promised land. So it's a feast in in this week that um, it's an entire week um, to rejoice before the Lord. Let me read to you the scripture. Uh, well, I could if I had my Bible. I guess I didn't get it up here. I thought I had it. I don't get it. Yeah, the Bible, and then there's an, another book with it, okay, with an orange cover. I've got all kinds of things to share today. Thank you. Oh, there it is. Okay, I had it. I just didn't bring it up. Well, you were busy. I was trying not to bother you. Thank you, sweetheart. <laughs> Didn't Pastor Tom do a great church. time with the worship today? Yes. <laughs> okay, I'm going to read to you from Leviticus 23. Can you say all the feasts are listed in Leviticus 23? If you want to go back and see what God says about the feast, that's what chapter you go to. And we are going to go to chapter 23, verse 39 to 44 because i want you to read i want to read to you from the word what god says okay now there's more around this i'm just taking out a snippet so you can go back and look at this so it says also on the fifth day of the seventh month which is nearly october which is th this coming monday night when you have gathered in the fruit of the land so it's harvest time okay you shall keep the feast of the lord for seven days the first day and the eighth day of each Sabbath. So it goes like for, for, that, for the eight nights, but seven days. And on this first day, you shall take the fruit of the pleasing trees and make booths out of them, these shelters. From palm trees, leafy trees, willows of the brook, and you. Sh this is what God says to do during the feast. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. You shall keep it as a feast of the Lord for seven days in the year, a statute forever. This is why we're still celebrating it today. And we've been engrafted in to, to, to Jesus' to Jesus's death and resurrection, and Jesus was Jewish. This is what he did. And Jesus fulfills many of these. This is the only one not fulfilled. When he comes back, it will fulfill the Feast of Tabernacles. So it says, you shall do this as a statute forever throughout your generations. You shall keep it in the seventh month, which this is the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths or shelters for seven days. All the native Israelites shall dwell in the booths may know that I made the Israelites dwell in booths 
when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. So this reminds us that God delivered his people from Egypt. How many of you need to be delivered right now from some wilderness places? God is on the scene. I believe we're about to see some things happening. And then it says, thus Moses declared to the Israelites the set and appointed feasts of the Lord. So these are appointments with the Lord that he is expecting us to show up. Amen. Amen. So let's talk about, before we talk about how to celebrate. Um, so the feast is basically celebrating God's glory living with us. Okay, so let's talk just a little bit about the presence of God. There's the manifest presence of God compared to simply his omnipotent presence. So we might call one level of his presence like God's intellectual presence. And that means that we can intellectually recognize that God exists everywhere and therefore, he must always be present. Would you all agree with that? It's his omnipotent presence. So in other words, God is everywhere. He must be whether I feel it or not. Would you all agree with that? Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> then we go from the intellectual presence of knowing that God is with us to more of a conscious presence of God. And so we might describe this conscious presence as being conscious, consciously feeling that he's present. Like John Wesley, he said once, he said, my heart was strangely warmed because he was experienced the more manifested presence of God, a conscious presence of God. So it can affect our five senses, okay, where we feel, we touch, we hear. And then there's a more intense manifestation of the presence of God where people are being healed, where it's more sweeping, it's more intense, it can change communities, it can change regions, when God just pours out his presence. Amen. And I believe that's that's what I'm believing for for Indianapolis and for the state of Indiana. Amen. Lord, send us revival. Send us revival. So a couple of ways that God's presence um, is evident, it's through miracles, through acts of power. Um, Sometimes when people feel his presence, they may say, I just knew God was speaking to me. Or I felt I was surrounded by his love. Maybe they said the room was filled with light or a strange light. Um, You may have a strange sensation. Um, a heat in your body, tingling of the fingers. Um, Some have said, I sensed God in a way I can't explain. I didn't see anything, but I felt I was face to face with him. This is a time we're coming into with the Feast of Tabernacles. This week coming up is about expecting to experience his glory and his presence. Amen? Amen. Now, we want to live this way every day. And this feast helps remind us that this is what God created us for, to dwell in us, to dwell with us by his Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. So God doesn't want his presence with us to be a strange phenomenon. Amen? Okay. Uh, Who has my other computer? Just sit right on top of the picture. Thank you. Okay, nice. <clears throat> Can you all see me okay, or is this going to be too big? Y'all okay? Okay, great. Get on the box. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, give me another few feet here. I would love to have longer legs. That would be, that would be a nice miracle. Thank you, Lord. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to tell you about one of the most special days that stands out in my heart. Um, 
there are several others, like when I got married and when I had my children, but I want to talk to you about a day that I spent in Israel. I, I made two trips to Israel, and this is one particular day that just stands out where the presence and the glory of God was just so magnificent. And I want to tell you like a few things that happened to me during that, okay? So um, it just, I think it was 2013, it might have been 2014, but what I do know is it was the very first day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And we, our tour went there and we were part of the ICEJ, which is the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem. And they put on this extravagant feast um, celebration for, I think it was seven nights. And so we came in along with people from 160 countries, about over 5,000 people had come in. And our team was the intercessory team. We'd go in early to pray over the, the events of the evening. So anyway, in the day, we're out touring. So this um, one particular day, um, I was really concerned about because I looked at the agenda and it's going to be a really long day. And one of the longest days of this particular trip, because we wouldn't be getting back till like after midnight on the bus that night, leaving out very early. Um, it was going to finish with worship and dinner in the desert at a, in a worship service. And so it was going to be quite long, you know, long getting back. The problem was at that time I had been in adrenal exhaustion and energy was it was challenging. Um, so I'm very concerned, am I going to make it back peacefully on this bus um, after a very you know, long day? So I just, I remember praying and I said, oh God, you need to help me. And I just asked you to strengthen me to make it through this day. And of course I wanted to enjoy it, you know, so I just gave it to him. So our day, our morning began in Qumran. Qumran is where the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. Does anybody know, um, just raising hands, um, are you familiar with some of the story of the Sea Scrolls? Okay, just, okay, great. Well, I'm going to share some things so you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, so Qumran is this, we're out in the desert, we're near the Dead Sea, and it's this, I don't, not a village, it's an area where a uh, priest and scribes lived and they lived very holy lives. We went in the ruins and there was dug out areas in the ground where they had bats and they were for ceremonial cleansing. These were the ones that they had the little black box on their head. So they'd have to be cle ceremonially cleansed, all these fasting, all these things before they would begin to even scribe the word of God onto these uh, parchments. So we got to take a tour of all this where they lived. And then out in the hillside here were, were caves and different things. And so our uh, tour guide takes us to this area and begins to tell us the story of when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered and what they were. So we're sitting there on these benches and sh she's telling us these facts of what happened. And I, I want to share some bits of this with you because this is one of the most significant finds, discoveries of the 20th century was these Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, I remember hearing about it, but I, I can't say I knew the story about it. So in 1947, a young Bedouin, so he's an Arab wanderer, nomad in the desert. He was a shepherd and he went searching for a lost sheep. He thought the sheep had gone into a cave. So he threw a rock in there to see if the sheep responded or, or came out. But instead, something unexpected happened. It sounded like something broke. So he went in there and saw these pots, these clay pots with lids, and they looked empty until he realized there were scrolls coiled up inside. So he got like, uh, he got a few of them and he took them to an antiquities dealer in Bethlehem. And so this guy sees us and he's like, 
I think like you've got something here. He goes, go back, go get, go get some more. And so I want to give you kind of a brief version of, so he went back, he found more. So the first find here is seven scrolls. Okay. So I want to give you the brief version of what happened with these seven scrolls. So th this is the account. Four of them ended up in the hands of an antiquity dealer in Bethlehem who then sold them to an archbishop of a Syrian monastery. So he sold, so basically Syria has four of these scrolls. Okay. This is, this guy is a key player. Okay. So we're going to follow him. The other three ended up in the Armenian antiquities dealer. And those were the ones in Bethlehem. And there was a Hebrew university professor that caught winds about this discovery of these scrolls. So he goes and tracks down this this antiquities dealer because he wants to investigate and see what a significant find this is. He wants to see what it is. So, so this Hebrew university professor braving through some Arab and Jewish tensions travels to meet the Armenian dealer at the British divided military zone on the Jerusalem border through a fence. And he's showing him part of leather that was that was with the scrolls. He's showing him just a sign of what it was. And so he's now intrigued. And he's like, I like I think we have something here. And then in this article I was researching, that I'm going to share with you. He began to I mean, it was like the presence of God was on him when he started to unroll and find out that it was a psalm one of the Psalms. And then there was almost a whole book of Isaiah that was that he had found. So this Hebrew university professor obtains these three for the universe for the Hebrew university. Okay. And because he recognized it was ancient biblical Hebrew, he was just I, it was, I, I would share it all with you, but it's kind of lengthy. But you can go back and, and look at that if you're interested. So meanwhile, so this Hebrew professor has three. Meanwhile, in 1949, there was so much regional turmoil. The Syrian archbishop that has the other four, he's getting kind of nervous. So he smuggles these four precious scrolls out of the country. Where does he go? To a Syrian church in New Jersey. <laughs> he brings them here to the United States. Okay. So they're there for about five years. In 1954, things get even more interesting. This Syrian archbishop places the same four scrolls up for sale in the Wall Street Journal in an advertisement. Have any of you heard about this? Okay. If you go on this website that I'm going to give you, you can see the clip of the article of this advertisement. This is what it says. Quote. The four Dead Sea Scroll dash biblical manuscript dating back to at least 200 BC are for sale. This would be an ideal gift to an educational or religious institution by an individual or group. Box F206, the Wall Street Journal. So if you were interested, you would reply to box F206. Is that... Is that amazing? <laughs> so the story gets crazier. So some Americans in the United States get in touch with Israel. They let them know that these scrolls are for sale and it's in the Wall Street Journal. So they get involved. And the tour guide, I was just fascinated. She said it just became very cloak and dagger, kind of like that mysterious meeting on the border, you know, through the fence and, um, so they had the, the secret meeting points. This American was the middleman negotiating on behalf of Israel, but Syria didn't know it. Okay. So he's playing the middleman to try to get these back for Israel. So what was happening was it was the son of the Hebrew university professor that was buying them from the American, then to get them back into the university on behalf of the state of Israel. Isn't that fascinating? So that happened in 54. 
In 55, the four scrolls are now joined with the other three. And they have pictures of them. Just they did not have enough tables. There was bright sunlight coming in the window to examine them, to preserve, to take care of them. So in 1965, the Shrine of the Book Museum was built. And it's a big round building with a top notch on the scroll. It looks like a big scroll. And it's the building that now houses those seven scrolls. And so it was right there in Kumon. So we went into it and I got to see all of the things and how these scribes and priests lived that were penning all these even before Jesus's birth. So, and that there was even stories about like, they think John the Baptist had been there at one point. It was just really amazing. So if you want to hear more of that, you know, look at more of that pictures of the Bedouin that found them and and different parts of the story. You can just go to deadseascrolls.org and then discovery and publication is where I found it. Um, but if you do dead, there's a bunch of different ones, but if you go to deadseascrolls.org and then discovery and publication, they have digital library clips of the original Wall Street Journal post, um, also of things, what the professor said that was really fascinating. So this is what intrigued me. I was so excited to hear about the discovery of God's word penned over 2000 years before and hidden like treasure in pottery in caves. You know, the reason the scrolls were in the pottery in the caves what they were saying was when the temple was destroyed after Jesus's resurrection in, in 70 <laughs> AD, there was word that they were coming and, and that they had destroyed the temple. So they knew they would be coming to them next and they didn't want God's word being destroyed. So they started putting it into these, these, uh, these clay pots with lids and put them in, I forget how many, all the, the different caves that they've invested, they, uh, they're all numbered. And they know what came out of one. There was one, was it K4, where just a lot of stuff came out of. It was from parchments, or, and then there was fragments. So, um, so anyway, just the fact that they, they wanted to protect God's word, that they had taken so much time to pay, and then here it was, saved up for us. I believe that God orchestrated this whole thing. I believe that God wanted, see 1947, see 1948, what, what was it, 48, when Israel became a state. Right before Israel becomes a, a state and a nation again, the word of God is excavated and uncovered. Amen. God had it all orchestrated to bring God's word alive again. I can't tell you the glory of God that I felt in that place, where God's written word was written and recorded over 2,000 years ago. Have you ever noticed that, that we can experience God's glory with his written word? How many, I have had, some of the best times I've had is when God's glory came upon me, when he was giving me revelation from his word, and I'm reading his word, and I feel his presence. Have you all experienced that? I'm praying that you're going to have some encounters even this coming week. Amen? Amen. Praise God. So, you know, we can experience God's glory and his presence when we delight in reading and studying, even singing his word. Amen. So the funny thing that happened, you know, funny things happen when you're in the presence of God. And sometimes things don't bother you when you're in the presence of God. Have you noticed that? If we can just if I just float around in the presence of God every day, I can just really behave myself. I just know that I could. So. <laughs> When we're going into Kumon, we're coming in to this area. There was a turnstile, and I, anyway, I dropped my phone. The screen breaks. Now I could kill, still use it, but it's all you know cracked up. It's hard to see the, the the screen. And do you know that it didn't bother me? Do you know what happened when I looked at that screen and I see that that cracked screen? Oh, Kumon. Oh, yeah, and Getty. And I start to remember all the events of that day. It was a delightful memory to me. It was not like, oh, curse the phone is broken. But in the glory of God. Amen. 
I, I took months to, before I fixed it. I think it was over three months before I even like, oh, okay, I guess I should get this fixed so I can read something on here. So I was on this incredible day, this adventure of a lifetime with my Lord, and he was my adventure companion. So the next stop on my glory adventure was the En Gedi Falls. Now, this is interesting. Never heard of this. And it was rarely in the 20 years this tour was going or 17 years. It had only been on the agenda one other time. So this was really rare that we were even going there. I might mention that it was like somewhere between 112 and 117 degrees that day oh, wow. in the desert. So the interesting thing about En Gedi, we saw these rock badgers in the trees. That was really cool, the wildlife that was there. But there was three falls that go up to the top of the mountain that overlook the Dead Sea. Okay. And the greatest of the falls, the most spectacular one was at the top of the mountain. It was called King David's waterfall because they believe this was one of the places where David and his men went when they were hiding from Saul because there was water. There was fresh water there. So it was really cool. We go in and it's real easy to find this first waterfall. And it's like a big pool and the water's coming down and these Israeli families are in their bathing suits just playing in the waterfall. And it, it was really awesome. And so my friend, uh, Apostle Sarah, her son was traveling with us and uh, she stayed back. But but Kevin, he really was interested in going all the way up to the three waterfalls. In my mind, I think, Carol, conserve your energy. Carol, conserve your energy, you know. And it's very hot. And then there was these three young people with us. One was an international attorney. One was a personal fitness trainer. And I forget the other one, but they're kind of young. And they were so energetic. They said, oh, you guys ride the bus. We're going to walk back to the hotel. You know, they they had lots of energy. And, and um, but we get to that first waterfall and they're all like, Oh man, no, it's too hot. We're, we're not going up there. It's way too hot. And, um, so then we go on to the, uh, second waterfall and it's up a bit higher and it's, it's really cool. And so we're just watching that. And so, so Kevin is saying, uh, pastor Carol Ann, can we, can we go on up and we'll go get the next one? And I'm looking around, I'm like, you know, Kevin, I don't even see where the path is. Like there was a very strategic path that we followed and I'm not seeing where it goes next. So I start, I see this canopy of trees. So I go over there and sure enough, there's this tunnel in this canopy of trees. There's another little waterfall. I peek in, there's this little water and there's a couple in there hiding. I'm like, okay, well, I won't, I won't bother them. And I look and then I see the light at the end of this tunnel. And man, it just felt like I was in an Indiana Jones movie and I got so excited and I'm like, game on, let's go. And I don't know, the Lord had to just give me a surge or something. So we go through there and we're winding up on this narrow path on the edge of this mountain. And Kevin says, he goes, now Pastor Carol, because he knew I had, I was having some health issues. And he said, you go ahead and lead and I'll follow you. You just go at your pace and I'll follow. I said, okay. So... <clears throat> I can just feel, you know, you feel your face is just bright red and you're burning up, you know, but we just kept going because we were on an adventure and we were in the glory of the Lord. We kept going up. Do you know that glory increased? We got up to the top of that mountain. It was so high and so we could not get it in the camera lens. We could not get the whole thing. And then down here, it's like, it was like a sandy beach. It was just beautiful. And there was one family. We were the only ones up there. And we we're so hot, but then the breeze on top of that mountain was just blowing over us, cooling us off. And <clears throat> it was just glorious, just looking out. And we, we felt like we were in the high heights of heaven. It felt like God was right there. So we just started praying some powerful prayers. And we just started making declarations. And part of what we were there at Israel to do, the, the declarations of scriptures that we came there with to pray over Israel. So we start, <clears throat> we're praying. And then 
we we went and picked up some pebbles and some rocks to remind us that we made it to the top. And then we realized we had like 15 or 20 minutes to get down this mountain to the bus or we were going to get left. So we start hoofing it down that mountain, but we're kind of laughing and like, I mean, the joy of God was on us, you know, and believing he was going to not let us be stranded there. So we go down there and we made it. We even had enough time. We went into the restrooms, threw some water on our faces. We came out and I got the most delicious cherry snow cone. It was so cold and refreshed. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is the best thing I've ever had. And we get into the bus and uh, the director, Judy, and she started asking questions and Kevin started telling her and they realized we had gone to, we were the only two that had gone to the top of the mountain. And <clears throat> I was the most unlikely person that they expected to do that. So they were, they were really kind of freaking out, but we were on an adventure with God and you need to know that if you're with God, he will take you to the top of wherever it is. He wants to take you. Amen. Amen. Can you all say, I'm going to the top. I'm going to the top with God. Your Lord is going to take you. He's going to personally escort you. You know what? I'm seeing a picture right now that as you're going, I see like a glory cloud around y'all. And angels are in the cloud with you and the Lord. Amen. Amen. God releases those angels to remove obstacles and make a path for you to go to where he originally designed you and planned. He has spectacular things for you to do. I took for me to accomplish 